Moving into section two, we'll cover methodology and terms. So starting out with terms that we've already um, discussed at earlier mods, but definitely worth review during the blue team operations. Types of malware. Malware stands for malicious software. These are the different types of malware. Malware is always categorized so that we know what type of malware we're working with. These are some of the different categorizations you can have. There's a longer list than what's here, but at a high level, I think these are the ones to definitely know what they are, terminology moving forward as you start out. Adware, we have a bunch of advertisements running. Bots, we've talked about botnets, DOSing, distributed, denial of service attacks. We've talked about zombies and botnets. So it's becoming um, you know, pretty much zombie or a bot that's gonna do something on behalf of the attacker. Ransomware, that's very hot at the time of this recording for a lot of threat act actors are coming in, encrypting um, the company's data, making demand for pay us our Bitcoin now, and we can decrypt the files that we encrypted for you, and we promise not to post it to the leak site for all of your company's sensitive data that we also expilled out of your network. A rootkit, remember in the Windows module, we talked about the registry and all of our main root keys associated within the Windows registry. Um, and the rootkit would be in there as a type of malware that is going to, the buzzword remember was persistence, survive the boot since you're going in and modifying the Windows registry and perform malicious action, actions in there, it's a type of malware. Spyware, collecting personal information without the user's consent. A Trojan horse, it seems legitimate, but it's actually malicious. So uh, back in the Roman days when we had the Trojan horse, that was like a gift, but inside all of the uh, army members were in there to then attack once they were let in. That is a Trojan horse, a virus and a worm. Same thing, except worms can be self-replicating and spread across without user interaction. The virus is going to need user interaction in order to propagate, someone's gonna to have to click it, download it, have it run, etc. Worm, self-propagating, self-replicating, and it's gonna spread very, very quickly through your network because it doesn't require that type of interaction. We can start talking about something new here, which we talked about the defense in depth onion of security where we have those multiple layers of security built in so that in the middle, our core data that we're trying to protect, at least the threat actor has to go through all of these defense in depth layers in order to finally gain access to our most critical resource. That's defense in depth, and it merges nicely with this concept of different layers of threats that you can have because each one of these layers can be vulnerable to attack. So we're gonna discuss a couple here. Starting with the application layer, this you can have malicious code injection, we can do SQL injections, cross-site scripting, we can do application level DOS attacks, we can have authentication attacks like password guessing, password spraying, or stealing user credentials. We can have web-based layer attacks, so we've talked about phishing attacks. You can have drive-by downloads where malicious code is automatically downloaded to a user's computer when they visit a site and malvertising, we're gonna use ads to distribute our malware. We want you to click on that uh, ad link and get our malware to propagate that way. Those are all web layer based. Moving into the network layer, we talked about the man in the middle attacks where you're gonna have that middleman. You have the router here and we're dealing with um, switches. You can have the attacker sit in line and kind of change packets directions right in the middle of where traffic should be traversing. They're intercepting your packets or they're eavesdropping on the traffic that's going across on your network. And then they're spoofing MAC addresses, spoofing IP addresses to be like, oh, yep, I'm that resource. Send all your data to me. Man in the middle, we're talking network layer attack. We've talked about denial of service attacks. We did the Smurf attacks, um, all the different attacks you can do with, with different TCP flags, Fraggle attacks, um, scanning, etc. IP spoofing. 
Again, were the attackers impersonating a legitimate IP address to gain access to the network? And lastly, you can have the layer of physical layer. This is actually theft or physical access to the device. So you are here on that corporate device where the data is, or you're on that server um, right there with access to the device. You can steal it, you can gain access, you can plug a USB into it, you can do social engineering where you're at the physical layer trying to get past all your um, CCTVs, your fences, dogs, um, security guards, badge readers, etc. So you're manipulating employees or people to surpass that physical layer, your perimeter outside. Um, you can also do physical damage to the equipment. It could flood. There could be an electrical fire. You can literally cut a cord, etc. So hopefully these kind of make sense for the different layers you can have. Application, web-based, network layer, physical layer. And if not, we also included a just sample step that we can talk through. So starting with a phishing link, I am an attacker. I send you a malicious email with a link in there that I want you to click that, click, that is time sensitive. And right here we are at the web-based attack layer. If you click the link and you go to our um, you know, site that looks like a Microsoft sign-in, but it's actually not, and you input your credentials, now I have your credentials, I've stolen them, and I now have access to your network, moving into the network layer attack. Maybe there's uh, moving into the application layer, a vulnerability that exists. We just talked about CVEs at the application layer that I can exploit, and then I can install my malware on it. Once I have that, maybe I can you know, move ladder within your network and get to a server and or if not, I can stay at that box and try and execute some sort of network-based attack and perform a denial of service to one of your um, server's websites or do a physical takedown of the server, etc. So kind of moving along different layers of how a threat would kind of play out. If you can start to think about in your head what layer you're at, what um, defense in depth onion layer you're peeling back and where it's kind of falling out. We are not going to talk about the cyber kill chain by Lockheed Martin or uh, attacker methodology too much, but all of this kind of goes into play and you need to start thinking about the concepts that you've learned in this course. Okay, how can we conceptualize this at a higher level now and bring all of the items together to a more uh, in-depth understanding of what's happening from a methodology approach to how attacks play out and where they're located essentially at the OSI layer. All right, I love this slide. I thought this meme was absolutely hilarious. This is essential. Uh, I would expect this to be on any interview question if you're going for a SOC analyst or cybersecurity analyst type role. Your true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative terminologies. This meme, I had to put it in here, definitely credit where credit's due to this link right here. This is the most hilarious thing I have seen and I hope that we can teach this in a way that you'll never mix up these terminologies for what they mean. So this is all based on your alerts. Alerts come in uh, and you're gonna review them and they're gonna fall into one of these four categories. As we go through this, it's best to replace true with the word correctly and false with the term incorrectly. I feel like if you can just read this as correctly, negative, that will help you in where I think most people get caught up with true and false. So let's start out with are true negative. This is a correctly predicted negative result that happened on the network. So if we think of this meme that is going through, a true positive would be a hot dog. So our alert came in, it identified the alert as a hot dog, and we cor correctly identified it as a hot dog. So that is a true positive. Again, replacing true with correctly, a correct positive. We identified it as a hot dog through our IDS or IPS or whatever we're using for alert-based detections, and it was actually a hot dog, so win-win, true positive. 
True negative is a correctly identified negative result. This pizza came in and it was not a hot dog. And we said it was not a hot dog. So we correctly identified something that was not a hot dog. So it is a true negative. False, we are replacing with incorrectly. So a false positive is, oh, it's a hot dog. We said it was a hot dog, but then when we researched it more into the alert, it's actually just a, a wiener dog and it's not really a hot dog. So we incorrectly identified a positive detection that we thought was a hot dog, but really it was not a hot dog. So we got it wrong. So a false positive is an incorrectly predicted positive result. We messed up, we have to start tuning our alert to not hit on the wiener dog, but actually try and hit more on the actual hot dog. The last one we have is a false negative, replacing false with incorrectly predicted negative result. So we said, oh, that is not a hot dog. But in fact, if you look at it, that is a hot dog. It may have some extra chili sauce going on and it might look different from this hot dog that just has mustard on it, but that is in fact a hot dog. So this is the most dangerous block to fall under, which is why I put it in red over here. A false negative means you missed a truly malicious event that occurred on your network and you didn't even get an alert for it. If the hot dog is malware here, if we truly identified malware as malware, that is a true positive alert. This is a happy block to be in because that means our detections for our alerts are triggering on malware that is actually malware. If we go over here and we don't have an alert that hit on malware, we are very sad because this can have the most negative impact on your organization. It's a critical miss for malware that you didn't identify and that you didn't even get an alert from to review. So it's a constant balance between organizations to not have so many false positives because you're afraid you're gonna have a false negative miss that you're constantly tuning 10,000 alerts per day, but you also have a level of an acceptance for risk for, okay, I think our alerts are pretty good. We have a great true positive rate and there's really no way to know what your false negative rate is, but you can kind of hopefully balance your false positive tunings where your, your SOC analysts aren't dismissing, you know, 5,000 alerts per day each to a level where maybe you only have, you know, a few hundred of alerts to tune out and review and further refine so that they always are going to hit on true positive and hopefully identify malware that you're missing. So, you know, we work out of this space 90% of the time for alerts that come in are false positives and the rest of the 10%, or I guess I can say 9% are true positive and then we miss 1% if we're really a great organization. Um, you know, we probably miss way more than we realize. So maybe this is more like 30%, but you didn't hear that from me. Um, definitely not my organization. So uh, it's a joke, but really how you do your false negative um, red teaming, have someone come in and pest, pen test your org and see if your alerts over here will catch the detection or not. A lot of training, drilling, uh, maybe you do a purple team exercise where you have a red team and a blue team come in and you're really trying to refine your blue team detections to be as great as you can. Testing for known malware, testing for known tactics and techniques that could be mapped to the MITRE attack framework, etc. So hopefully this chart, if you just think of this meme, um, it was too good to, to not include. Always get your terms right, especially if you're going for a cybersecurity analyst role or a SOC analyst position. All right, we have Pickerel for SANS getting into like IR, incident response methodology. Pickerel stands for preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. This is the SANS framework. Uh, we'll talk about NIST next, but I like SANS. They're one of the industry leaders and I like the Pickerel uh, framework that they provide. 
So for incident response methodology, we start with preparation, we make our policies, our tools, we give training to people. Then we go into identification. What do we need to know? Um, identifying uh, unusual files. We're looking at log analysis. If we find something malicious, we'll move into containment. We need to cut off the malware from spreading through our organization. Once we do that and we have identified all systems that were pot potentially um, impacted by the malware and we've contained all of them, now we can focus on eradication, getting that malware out of our organization, uh, rebuilding systems, re-imaging systems, scanning again, we might break out our network to um, like a red, green, a red, yellow, green, where red was active malware, yellow, we've re-imaged it, cleaned it up, and we're scanning it again, or we're monitoring it for 24 to 48 hours with our tools. And then if no alerts or activity of interest comes to that, we'll move it back into our green network and we will start our recovery process. So returning back to operations after surviving that incident response engagement that we're, we're having or dealing with the malware at scale. Um, we wanna build documentations to be like, how do we prevent this from happening, which blends into lessons learned, which is basically, what did we do? What happened? What can we improve upon? How can we take steps to prevent this incident from happening in the future? How can we update our policies and procedures to make our cybersecurity posture overall um, more elite or at a higher level, et cetera. So incident response methodology, you have the SANS pick Earl approach here, and then you also have NIST. NIST has their own framework that they provide for incident response. And NIST, if you haven't heard of them, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they do a wide range of standards and guidelines for businesses or government agencies, um, anything in IT, cybersecurity, energy manufacturing, etc. They post a lot of special publications. So there's an SP um, 800. There's different ones for the IR um, framework and publication that they're putting out to kind of outline their frameworks. NIST is like a gold standard. A lot of organizations try to uh, uphold a NIST standard when it comes time for auditing. But basically, steps over here. We're protecting our network as best as we can. We're detecting our alerts through um, whatever tools stack we have at our organization. We're responding to those alerts when they get detected on. Again, true positive, um, categorizing those and moving on to recovering. How do we contain everything and uh, remediate it? And then how do we identify um, and further protect our organization um, you don't have to start at one square over here and go around. You can be at any of the stages, but generally you're starting with identify and protect or protect all the way back to re-identifying again, and it works in a, a circle. So it's just a framework for incident response that organizations can use to help them stay organized or move through the, the phases of dealing with an incident uh, at their company.